everybody, welcome back to my channel. This is Unapologetic Skincare and Beauty. I'm Stephanie and this is Mystery Monday. This case is going to start off a new true crime series on my channel simply titled Missing. At any given time in the United States, there are 100,000 missing persons cases active. One of the most mysterious and prominent missing persons cases is the Maura Murray case. It is a huge mystery. It's such a tangled mess of mystery and miscommunications and the unknown that I really think it interests a lot of people and a lot of people want to find out what the answer is. This case is so extensive, there's so much information, there's so many theories, there's so many people out there looking into it and finding new things out every day, even so many years later, that I'm going to have to break this actual case into two videos, otherwise the videos will be way too long. And I will not make you wait another week for part two of the Maura Murray case. I will be putting it out just a couple of days after, probably Wednesday or Thursday, I'll put it out for you guys to see, I won't make you wait. but. It is gonna take a lot of explaining. There's a lot of stuff going into it, so let's just get right in and get started. Maura Murray was a 21-year-old college student. To the outside observer, she had the perfect life. She was pretty and smart. She had a really good group of friends, a supportive family, a good boyfriend. On February 9th, 2004, Maura crashed her car on Route 12 in New Hampshire. She walked away from the crash and she's never been heard from again. Moore was born on May 4th, 1982 in Hanson, Massachusetts, the fourth child of Fred and Lori Murray. She had two brothers, Fred who was older, Kurt who was younger, and two sisters, Kathleen and Julie, who were both older than Mora. Moore attended Whitman Hanson Regional High School where she was the star athlete of her track team and a straight A student. With her academic and athletic achievements, Moore could have her pick of colleges and she chose West Point Military Academy in New York. At West Point, she studied chemical engineering for three semesters before abruptly leaving and enrolling in the University of Massachusetts Amherst to study nursing. Julie, Mora's older sister, also attended West Point, and it was thought that Mora probably followed her there because the two were very close. According to Julie, they were best friends. They were also very competitive though, as sisters can often be. During high school, they were both on the track team and their father was their coach and he pushed them to kind of be the best. But obviously, when you're two sisters who are interested in the same things and involved in the same things, there's going to be that little bit of competition there, that little bit of a need to prove who's better and who's best and kind of win a parental approval of some kind. And, and I do think that there was some of that there in Maura and Julie's relationship. So why did Maura leave West Point after working so hard throughout high school academically and athletically in order to be able to write her own ticket when it came to college? Her cadet records at West Point show a pattern of behavior that was unexpected from the girl that Maura had shown the world. She was this all-American, good girl, she was great in school, she was great at sports, she had close friends, what appeared to be a close family. Yet when you look at her cadet records from West Point, they show a pattern of behavior and a picture drawn of a girl that does not fit what Maura showed the world. According to her file, in August of 2001, Maura was caught stealing makeup from the commissary at Fort Knox. An honor investigative hearing was held to determine what would happen with Mora, which shows they had enough evidence against her to hold a trial. Allegedly, Mora pled guilty and it was recommended that she be removed from West Point. The final decision on her fate was scheduled to be announced at the end of January 2002. Yet unexpectedly, before the school could decide anything, Moore withdrew herself from the school on January 2nd of 2002. Another interesting fact that comes up in her records is that during the year of 2001, Moore was actually put in front of the disciplinary committee seven times. Did Moore change from the wholesome, all-American good girl that she seemed to be in high school, or was that dark side of her always there? and she just hadn't gotten caught before because she wasn't in a place as strict as West Point. Maura was raised in an Irish Catholic family and although her parents did divorce when she was six, she did maintain a good relationship with both of them. She lived with her mother from the time that her father and her mother separated, but she was very close to her father. They spent a lot of time together. He was always the one dropping them off to practice, picking them up from practice, going to their games. 
After leaving West Point, Mora was accepted into the highly competitive nursing program at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She was really a special person. She was a star athlete. She was top of her class in high school and college. She got into a nursing program that has been described as extremely difficult to get into and she did very well in that program. She was working two jobs while she went to school. She was also dating a man she met in 2001 when she was at West Point. He was also at West Point during that time. He was a couple years older than her, but even when she left New York and she went to Massachusetts, they kept the relationship going. They knew it was going to be hard long distance, but they cared about each other enough to give it a try. Mora literally had everything in front of her. She was bright, she was funny, she was beautiful. She was described as having one of those like dazzling smiles. She had dimples. She was just really, you know, what you would what you would want your daughter to be if you had a daughter. She had her whole life in front of her and she probably could have done anything she wanted with it. At the same time though, every person has two sides to them. We have the side that we show the world and we have the side that we keep to ourselves. What Mora would reveal during her time at UMass would turn her image as a good, wholesome, all-American girl right on its head. Some would say Mora dodged a bullet getting out of West Point before they had a chance to deal her any consequences. Some would also say that that might scare a normal person from misbehaving like that again, but not Mora. The November before she went missing, Maura got in trouble for using another person's credit card to order food in mass quantities and have them delivered to her dorm room. She says she got the credit card number out of a bathroom garbage can and it was on a receipt and she just took that number from the receipt she found in the garbage and used it to order food like pizza and subs and salads and things. But the weird thing was, I don't know, I mean it's 2004. Were there credit card numbers printed on receipts? It just feels like a weird story. I'm not sure even at that time that credit card numbers in their entirety were printed on receipts, but that was the story that she gave. Could that have been a lie? It could have been. Would it be her first and last? No, it wouldn't. So she basically took this person's credit card number and then ordered a bunch of food to her dorm room and it was a lot of food, so when she ordered the food, she wasn't ordering just one sub or one salad or one pizza. She was ordering like two subs and a salad and a pizza. And it was really strange that this one girl would order so much. It didn't appear that she was ordering for anybody else. Nobody had come forward and said that they were with her when she ordered the food or that she had ordered the food for them. So this started the kind of rumor at first that Mora was bulimic. We don't know for sure that Mora was bulimic. Her roommate previously at UMass did say that it was well known that she was bulimic and it was even said that her family would make comments about it like during Thanksgiving about why are you even gonna bother leaving room for that? You're just gonna throw everything up later. So allegedly this was kind of well known within her friend and family circle but it's still a rumor that she was bulimic but that would make sense why she was ordering that much food. She basically didn't get in trouble for this so much as a slap on the wrist. They took her picture in front of the dorm and this picture of her is just so weird. It doesn't look anything like the pictures you see of her from high school smiling and running track and hanging out with her family. She looks like a different person. Basically they said, you know, we're not going to do anything right now but you need to stay out of trouble for the next six months or we're gonna bring charges against you. Let's get into the days leading up to Mora's disappearance. We're gonna start with the evening of February 5th. So on the evening of February 5th, Mora was scheduled to work a shift at the security desk of one of the dorms. The dorm she was scheduled to work at was Melville Hall, which was very actually close to her own dorm. It was reported by people who were working with her that she was acting completely normal until about 1 a.m. At that point, she started sobbing uncontrollably, visibly upset, visibly, you know, having some sort of emotional reaction to something, but nobody could figure out what. So they got the supervisor, and her name was Karen, and Karen came over to the desk that Mora was sitting at and, you know, was basically trying to get something out of her. What's wrong? She kept asking, what's wrong? And at that point, Mora had stopped crying and was just staring blankly past her. 
Karen described her as being completely out of it, just staring past her like she wasn't even there, not responsive, not moving, staring off into space. So Karen kept pushing, you know, what's going on, what's happening, and at this point she kind of realized that Maura wasn't going to be able to do her job. There was people trying to get into the dorm and show their IDs, and Maura was supposed to be checking that kind of stuff and just making sure that everybody coming in was supposed to be there, and she really just wasn't doing that. She was staring off into the distance. So Karen keeps pushing for answers and finally Maura starts crying again and Karen says what's wrong and Maura finally just simply responds my sister and points down to her phone. An investigation later of Maura's cell phone records would show that she had talked to her sister, not Julie, but her other sister, Kathleen. She talked to Kathleen, I think, between you know 10, 10 and 10.30 that evening. There was another phone call on her phone records that evening before her mental breakdown, and that was to her boyfriend, Billy Rausch, her long distance boyfriend that she had met from West Point, and they spoke from 12.07 to 12.14. So once, Karen, Mora's supervisor, saw that Mora wasn't really going to be able to finish her shift, which I, I think was over at like 145 anyways. She told Mora, you know, go home, get out of here, you can leave. And Mora just sat there and didn't respond, didn't do anything, just stared off in the distance. So Karen basically figured Mora wasn't going to get up of her own accord and do this, if she was out of it, there was something seriously wrong. So she took the initiative to gather up Mora's belongings and help Mora to the door and walk her over to her own dorm, which like I said, was not a, a very long distance, it's basically just right next door. When they arrived at the dorm, Karen offered to come up with Mora and talk. She said she could definitely tell that Mora was distraught. There was something wrong with her. She wasn't faking it. She wasn't trying to get out of work early. She could tell something was actually wrong with this girl and she was worried about her, but Mora told her, don't worry, I'm not gonna be alone. I have a roommate. And Karen let her go upstairs and left. That was a lie. Mora did not have a roommate. She had a single room at that point. And Karen has since said this. She really never forgave herself for not kind of pushing more insisting that she come up and finding out what was wrong with Maura because there clearly was something wrong with her. On February 7th, Fred Murray, Maura's father, drove up to pick Maura up from her dorm and bring her car shopping. Apparently her car was not in good shape. Fred often drove down every weekend or every other weekend to see his daughter, so it wasn't uncommon for him to be there visiting her and he would stay in a nearby motel. When questioned later about it, Fred had said Morris Carr had been acting up and it wasn't in good shape basically, which kind of struck me as odd because this is 2004 and it was a 1996 Saturn, which at, at the time this was happening, it would have only been an eight-year-old car. I don't know about you, but when I was in college, I drove a car that was way older than eight years old, and it was a clunker, it wasn't a great car. It got me from point A to point B, and it would constantly kind of break down. You know, me not changing the oil ever, and the engine just exploding, but we would fix it, and um, and you know, that was what I had to work with, because I was a broke college student. So I think it's weird, because she lived on campus, so she, and she worked on campus, so she wouldn't have had to drive really far all the time. And I feel like an eight-year-old car that just acted up sometimes would have been okay to have, you know, for that moment. But he did say that that's why he drove up that weekend, that she needed a new car, and he was gonna help her find a new car. None of Maura's friends actually report knowing that Fred was coming up to help Mora find a car. None of them report Mora ever complaining that her car was in bad shape. Um, and none of them remember Mora talking about her going car shopping with her father that day afterwards, even the next day or that night. In fact, after they went shopping for a car, they had dinner with one of Mora's friends, Katie. And Katie says that the entire dinner, while she was having dinner with Fred and Mora, they didn't mention car shopping at all, which I think is kind of strange because if you were having dinner with someone right after you'd done something, would you not discuss it even amongst yourselves or to just kind of have conversations, so that was a little strange to me. After leaving dinner, Fred drives the two girls to a liquor store, and this is kind of where his story branches off a bit. At first, he said he drove them to the liquor store, and then he waited outside for them to get what they had to get and come back out. 
When he tells the story again though, he said that he drove them to the liquor store and then at one point he told them, you know, hurry up, pick something out, this is taking too long. So that would suggest that he was actually in the store with them when they were buying the alcohol. He definitely knew they were buying alcohol though. That is one thing, whether or not he was in the car or in the store, that's really not important. What matters though is he knew they were buying alcohol and that they were attending a party that night on campus. So this is where things start to get a little weird and where I have a hard time understanding why the series of events that happened next happened. So Fred was, like I said, staying at a nearby hotel and instead of dropping the girls and their bags of liquor off at the campus, he gave Mora his brand new car, like brand new, he had just bought it. She dropped him off at his hotel or motel and then she drove back to campus so Moore drops him off at his motel and then she drives back to campus with all her liquor that she bought for this party that she's attending with her friends Katie and Sarah. So Katie and Sarah were friends through Moore. I think that's how they knew each other. Katie was friends with Moore from the track team and Sarah was friends with Moore from one of Moore's jobs at the art gallery. They knew each other through there. So this was a party that Sarah was throwing. My question is, why would Fred Murray give his 21 year old daughter who had just purchased a good amount of alcohol to go to a party where there will be drinking happening because she just bought alcohol for this party so you know there's gonna be drinking happening at the party. Why would he then hand her the keys to his brand new car and say you go to the party and you know see you later. I just I don't understand why that happened. Why wouldn't he just drop them off at the dorm or the party and then say, give me a call when you guys need to get picked up, like I'll be right around the corner or I'll be at my motel and I'll come get you and bring you where you need to go. It just would have made more sense for that to happen, but that's not what happened. So Katie, Sarah, and Mora went to this party and here's another weird thing about this whole case. Neither Katie nor Sarah remember anything about the party that night. They don't remember who was there. They don't remember what happened. They don't remember when Mora left or if she left with anyone. They don't remember anything. And I understand that it's been quite a while. But Katie was interviewed by the police in the days following Mora's disappearance, which would have been only a couple days after this party. And she claimed to the police at that point that she did not know anyone at the party and she couldn't remember who was there. Now, once again, this might not be strange because Katie was Mora's friend from the track team and Sarah was Mora's friend from the art gallery. So if this was Sarah's party, it may have been Sarah's friends and it would have followed to believe that Katie might not have recognized or knew anybody at that party. But Sarah would have, right? It was Sarah's party, it was at her place, I suppose it would have been people she invited and yet she claims she doesn't remember anything about it and she also doesn't know who was there. It's sort of semi-confirmed that Moore left around 2.30 or 3, saying she had to get the car back to her father's motel. And I guess Katie tried to talk her into staying, you know, saying you can do this tomorrow or just wait, sober up, get some sleep, bring it back in the morning. But um, Moore was insistent that she had to bring it back to her father's motel, so she left. Some people say she left with a man, although they don't know who, and some people say she left alone. And when I say some people, I mean Katie and Sarah because nobody else that we know of was at the party because they don't remember anybody who was there. So Maura leaves the party, clearly she's been drinking, and she heads back to Fred's motel in Amherst. At some point when she was driving on her route, there was, you know, like a T intersection sort of. So there's the road and then you can choose to either go this way or this way. And she literally drove straight through the T, right into a guardrail, and totaled her father's brand new Toyota Camry. It was reported that there was between eight to $10,000 worth of damage done to this vehicle, and that the insurance company eventually just had to total it because it wasn't salvageable. So quite a bit of damage to this car, and she had been drinking. I cannot find any proof or any kind of information saying that she ever got in trouble for this accident, which is crazy to me because she's a college kid, she was driving, she was clearly intoxicated, and she crashed her dad's car. But there's no sign to me that 
she was ever in trouble. I don't know what happened. I don't know how this girl continued to get herself into troublesome situations and talk herself out of it. Or I'm not sure how this happened without her being at least brought in overnight to like a police station to sober up. So she basically had her dad's car towed back to his motel. She caught a ride with the tow truck driver, ended up back at Fred's motel, and somehow ended up in his room even though she didn't have a key and he was asleep. He claims he was asleep, he did not know that she came in, and he didn't know that she spent the entire night there. He only knew that she had been in his room and was still in his room when he woke up the next morning. So that's weird to me. First of all, as a single guy, only staying for a weekend just to visit your daughter at college, are you gonna get a room that has two beds? Or are you gonna get a room that has one bed? So if we're going on this kind of assumption that the room only has one bed, where does she sleep? Is that weird or is that not weird? I don't know, but there's some speculation that she initially went into the lobby and fell asleep there on the couch and the front desk guy came over and like brought her to her dad's room, but at that point, like still, he didn't wake up. So the story's kind of a little iffy there. Either he woke up and let her in, or somebody else had to let her in, at which point I hope he would wake up, or the person who let her into his room would have wakened him up to be like, hey, do you know this girl? Can she be here? But either way, she ended up in his room all night. That night, a call was made from Fred's cell phone to Maura's boyfriend, Billy, and we assume that Maura made the call because maybe her phone was dead and she didn't have her charger on her and she didn't expect to be gone all night, so her phone was probably dead and she used Fred's phone to call Billy. So the accident happened around 3.30 a.m. and this call to Billy from Fred's phone takes place around 4.49 a.m. so that basically gives her about a little bit over an hour to get in the car accident, have the tow truck come, pick her up, hook up the car, tow it to the motel, somehow get into her father's locked room where he's sleeping, and call her boyfriend. But that's how it went down. According to Billy, what transpired between them during this call was, you know, short and sweet. She was upset about the accident, understandably, because that had to have been really unsettling. And he calmed her down, talked to her a little bit, and then told her, you know, he would call her later in the day and to get some rest. The next morning, Fred claims Maura was really apologetic and felt really bad about the accident. You know, she was really down on herself and he says he feels bad, you know, thinking about it now because she was so down on herself, she felt like she disappointed her dad and that he was gonna be angry with her and he claims he wasn't even really that angry with her, you know, that he told her like, don't worry about it, the insurance is gonna cover it, it's not a big deal and that is another thing I find it hard to believe and hard to wrap my head around, but I could go either way. So, you know, your daughter crashes your brand new car, are you just so grateful and relieved that she's okay and unharmed that you kind of forget about everything else or are you kind of pissed because she was drinking and she chose to get behind the wheel of your car and drive it into a guardrail and you know she could have hurt herself and she could have hurt somebody else so just to be completely cool with it and kind of be like nah don't worry it's okay I don't know if he reacted that way I think he might have been more angry than he lets on but it was the last day that he saw her so he may not want to you know led on to the fact that they had argued or that he had yelled at her. Later on, Fred drove Maura back to her dorm. He told her once again, you know, don't worry about it, it's fine, like, don't be upset. And, you know, he watched her walk into her dorm and that's the last time that he saw her. She did speak with him on the phone a couple of hours later, at which point he told her he talked to his insurance company that it looked like it was gonna be covered and see everything's okay after all, but that he would need um, accident reports for the insurance company and asked her to get those and take care of that for him. The next day was February 9th, and this is the day that Maura disappeared. She did a lot of very strange things that day. Around midnight, Maura's search history showed that she was looking for directions to the Berkshires, Lancaster, Vermont, and Burlington, Vermont. At 12.55 that afternoon, she made a call to a condo in Bartlett, New Hampshire, looking for some information on renting a condo. The call lasted for about three minutes and no rental resulted from that call. Bartlett, New Hampshire was a special place 
for Mora because she and her family had spent, you know, summers and winters there in the past since she was a little girl. Um, it meant a lot to her. She had some really good times in her childhood there and, you know, it was a place she was familiar with. So at one o'clock, so it looks like right when she got off the phone with the condo people in Bartlett, she sent an email to her boyfriend, Billy. I guess she'd been ignoring calls from him all morning and um, the email was supposed to be her response to his calls. The email subject is, hey, hey, and the email says, I love you more, stud. I got your messages, but honestly, I didn't feel like talking to much of anyone. I promised to call you today, though. Love you, Mora. Billy doesn't respond to this email and he continues to try to call Mora. These calls are ignored. So at 1.05 p.m., Mora calls 1-800-GO-STOW, and this is basically like a tourist information phone number for Stowe, Vermont. That call lasted for about five minutes, but later it was discovered that the line was down at the time Mora tried to call, so she would have been able to listen to pre-recorded information, but she wouldn't have been able to talk to anyone or to actually, you know, rent anything. At 1.13 p.m., Mora calls and leaves a voicemail for a classmate that she borrowed a lab coat from, saying she wants to return the lab coat. At 1.24 p.m., Mora emails her professors and her supervisors at work and tells them there's been a death in her family and she won't be able to come into work or go to classes for about a week. She'll let them know when she gets back. That was a lie again. There was no death in the family. At 2.18 p.m., Mora calls and leaves a voicemail for Billy telling him that they will talk soon. The only reason that Billy missed that call and wasn't able to answer it was because he was on the phone with Katie at that time, Mora's friend, probably trying to figure out what the heck was going on with Mora. Why was she ignoring his calls? Was something going on? It's reported that he was a little bit suspicious and kind of controlling at times, so maybe he was trying to get from Katie if there was somebody else or what she'd been doing and why she was acting strange and weird. At 2.21, 2.22, and 2.24, there are three calls from Billy, and Mora ignores all three. It appears at that point that Mora packed the entire contents of her dorm room up. She took the art and pictures off of the wall, took all her belongings, put them in boxes, put them on top of her bed. On top of those boxes, she printed out an email from Billy, and, um, and she left that email there. Now this email, I don't know exactly what's in it. I couldn't find a copy of it. I'm, I'm sure it's out there, maybe, but I could not find a copy of it. But allegedly this email was talking about a past infidelity of Billy's, and I believe that the email was at least six months old. It wasn't a current email. The infidelity hadn't been current as far as I know, and it happened in the past. So why Moore chose to print that email out and put it on top of the boxes is another part of this mystery that we just don't know. It does feel like she left it there for a reason, though, right? Like to send a message or to give a message to someone, I'm not, I'm not sure. At 3 p.m., Mora leaves UMass, leaves the campus, takes her black Saturn that's apparently a wreck and not driving well, and she leaves the campus. She's headed for the White Mountains in New Hampshire, just across the Massachusetts border. Here are the specifics of what happened when Mora left campus, what she did, which, is weird. At 3.30, Mora withdrew $280 at an ATM from her bank account. This appears to be all the money she had. I think she left something like $16 in there. So she pretty much pulled out everything she had that they would let her take because the bank lets you take out money in increments of $20. So she probably couldn't take that other 16 out of the ATM. Surveillance video footage of the ATM shows that Mora was alone and she didn't appear to be scared or stressed. It didn't appear like there was somebody behind her forcing her to take the money out and she seemed fine. Right after she left the ATM, she went to a liquor store and purchased $40 worth of alcohol. Allegedly, the receipt shows she bought a box of Franzio red wine, Kahlua, Baileys, and vodka. At 4.37, Mora calls her voicemail at the dorm to check her voicemails. This was the last time that Mora would actually use her phone to place a call. At 5 p.m., her cell phone pinged a cell tower within 20 miles of Londonderry, New Hampshire. This probably indicates that somebody placed a call to her. At 7.27 p.m., a resident reported a car accident on Route 112. Mora's car was traveling eastbound when it struck something, either trees or a snowbank. I'm not quite sure on that. And it spun around so that it was facing westbound in the eastbound lane. The car was in bad shape. The driver's side windshield was cracked. It looked like there had been some sort of impact on that driver's side windshield. And um, 
both the airbags had deployed. Initially, the witness who called this in said she thought she saw a man sitting in the passenger seat and smoking a cigarette. Later though, that witness would retract that statement and say she might have been wrong, that the light that she thought was a cigarette just could have been a red light, and Mora was actually using a cell phone at that time that had a red light on it. It was like an old school Samsung flip phone, so that had a red light that would have blinked or maybe been on when she was making a call. The witness doesn't know for sure if she saw a man sitting in the passenger seat smoking a cigarette or if it was Mora possibly trying to use her phone. Around 7.33, a school bus driver named Butch Atwood was on his way home from work and he came across the crash and he stopped to see if Mora needed help. He got out, he spoke with her for a couple minutes and he basically asked her, you know, do you want me to call the police? She begged him not to call the police. She said she'd already called AAA and she was all set. But Butch knew because he lived right around the corner that there was no cell phone service in that area. She couldn't possibly have called AAA because she wouldn't have been able to get a signal on her cell phone. When Butch spoke with Mora, he said she didn't appear to be hurt, there wasn't any blood, but she was shivering and she appeared to be intoxicated. Because of all this, the fact that she seemed to be intoxicated, that she couldn't possibly have called AAA. Butch ignored her request to not call the police. He went home and he made a call into the police, letting them know about the accident. At 7.46 p.m., the first police officers arrive on the scene. They find Moore's car locked and empty. There's no sign of her anywhere. They also found a box of red wine behind the driver's side seat, and they found red liquid on the driver's side door, also on the roof or the ceiling of the car. They also found a Diet Coke bottle, which had been emptied out of the Diet Coke, and inside there was a red liquid that smelled strongly of alcohol. So what are we getting from this? They don't come right out and say it's wine in the Diet Coke bottle, but there's a box of wine behind the driver's side seats. There's red liquid on the driver's side door, as well as on the ceiling or the roof of the car, and there's a Diet Coke bottle that clearly has wine in it. So from this, we do believe that Mora was drinking and driving it again. What's, what's really strange is they didn't find any of that other alcohol that she purchased. It was just the box of red wine left in the car. The other three bottles of alcohol were gone with Mora. What they did find in the car though might be telling. They found a AAA card with Mora's name on it. They found blank accident report forms. They found black leather gloves, they found makeup, jewelry, and CDs. They found a book about climbing in the White Mountains titled Not Without Peril. This book was about hikers who were hiking in these mountains and were either injured or never returned. They found map quest directions to Stowe, Vermont and Burlington, Vermont. They found her college textbooks, including her syllabus. And they found birth control pills with three missing. They also found over-the-counter pills. I think they were described as being Tylenol PM or Simply Sleep, which is by the makers of Tylenol PM. Her favorite stuffed animal, which was a monkey, and a bag with some running clothes and other kinds of clothes. They did not find her license. They did not find her credit cards, her keys or her cell phone. At 7.54, a bolo, or a be on the lookout, was issued for a female, about 5'7", on foot. The police began to search the surrounding area, but there was no sign of Mora at all. The police assumed that Mora had been drinking, crashed her car, and fled the scene to avoid you know, getting a DWI. They said it's pretty common when that happens for people to leave so that they can sober up, so that by the time they are found and they have you know, a breathalyzer done, that they're not showing any elevated levels of blood alcohol. So they thought that was kind of common. They didn't find anything out of the ordinary about the situation. A possible sighting of more did happen between 8 and 8.30. A contractor coming home from work saw a person walking pretty quickly on foot. And this was, um, like I said, between 8 and 8.30, and they were walking eastbound along Route 112, about five miles from the crash site. He said this person was wearing jeans, a dark coat, and a light hood. By 8.50, all emergency responders had been cleared, the car had been towed, and nobody had found Mora. This is kind of a vanished without a trace situation. Mora's never been seen or heard from again, at least not verified. There's been sightings, you know, people claim they've seen her in certain places in the world, but nothing's been verified. 
There was one phone call though that her boyfriend Billy received when he was actually in the airport going through security on his way to New Hampshire to help look for her. In this phone call he received, they left a voice message because he wasn't able to get to the phone and he describes the voicemail to be sort of like a soft breathing, crying, maybe a whimper, and he thinks that it was Mora. Her actual cell phone wasn't used for that call. Her actual cell phone was on Billy's plan. This call was made from a calling card, basically, a prepaid calling card, and it couldn't be traced. But Mora, before she'd been added to Billy's cell phone plan, had been known to use prepaid calling cards as her way of calling because she didn't have a cell phone. So I think that's why they thought it was Mora. You know, there's nothing to say that it was or wasn't. Mm -hmm. 